Hey everybody, Kevin Phillips here, Editor-in-Chief at CampusReform.org. We're joined today for a, a special conversation with Spencer Clavin. Uh, he is the host of the Young Heretics podcast, as well as the Assistant Editor of the Claremont Review of Books. So, Spencer, thanks so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So, I want to get right into it. Uh, for our guests that aren't familiar with you, you're an expert in uh, kind of Western culture and history, literature, all of those great things. And and that's where your Young Heretics podcast is, is kind of kicking off. So, can you tell us a little bit about the podcast, what you guys have done so far, and, and moving forward, what you're really focused on? Yeah. You know, the show started really because I just had this deep sense of sorrow about what was going on in the academy and happening, especially to the American Academy, but in Europe as well. You know, I'm, I'm a creature of the universities. I uh, did my bachelor's at Yale and then did a PhD over in, in Oxford. And so academia is, is not foreign to me at all. And I, I, I love or I, I love what used to be our culture of high learning in this country and abroad. But I just watched steadily over the past several years at, as, I mean, it's really a mind virus is this kind of infection where you have to, you know, decide whether your authors are the right race and the right gender before you approve them. And the, the first time it really kind of hit me was in 2016 at Yale, my alma mater, they, they decolonized the English curriculum. So they didn't want to, you know, read as many white males. And so they ended up, you know, you, you can graduate basically with an English degree without reading Shakespeare or Chaucer or the, you know, basically all of English literature is, is these guys. So, um, and that's only gotten worse. You know, it's, it's been particularly bad these past few months as the country has basically spiraled into insanity. But, but really this is a, a, something that's been coming for a long time. And I just started to feel like it had reached a breaking point where people were being denied the classical education that is really everybody's heritage. We, we think of this as something rarefied, but it's not. The West understood as these sort of cultural products of Athens and Jerusalem, these, these treasures of literature and history and philosophy, which come down to us over centuries and, and millennia. These things, you know, are, belong to everybody and they contain profound wisdom about how to live your life. And they're just being basically shunted out of the way in favor of this nonsense philosophy about racialism and gender and so forth, and, you know, LGBT queer theory, whatever. And I just decided, you know, what about a podcast where instead of fighting with those people all the time, because we do get, you get so mad about that, that we constantly react. Uh, but Young Heretics basically says, you know what, we're, our way of fighting with these guys is basically just to say, shrug them off and, and spend time digging into the riches of, of the West. So every episode once a week, we just pick something that really, I think, has something to say for our times. And, and we go on a deep dive, either me or me and a guest, into uh, what these treasures of our culture have to say to us now. And so the name Young Heretics, uh, I have an idea of where that comes from, but can you can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. People have gotten mad at me about this, especially because <laughs> when I have guests on, I call them honorary heretics. And I always have to say in advance, like, are you cool being? We had Senator uh, Ted Cruz on and I had to say to him beforehand, you know, it will it like bother your constituency if I call yeah. you an honorary heretic? Because it sounds like, you know, people it, it's not religious heresy at all. It's got nothing to do with religion. And in fact, you know, many of my guests and I myself am a Christian and wouldn't want to be considered a heretic in that regard. But the it's kind of a, a wry, a coy reference to the fact that identity politics has become this religious dogma in the universities and in our halls of higher learning and even just in any kind of mainstream college campus you might send your kids to. And so we're young because we're, you know, in the kind of college and just thereafter range. And that's a lot of my audience as well is, is in that range. Um, but, you know, we're, we're mostly heretics from this dogma of identity politics. We just sort of shrug it off. We, we refuse to kowtow to it. And we just, you know, uh, think that it's a it's a false faith. Uh, I don't know if, if you've given me the title yet, but I'm just going to assume the title of honorary heretic. Oh, you should uh, definitely but, take it. Yeah, <laughs> whether you bestow it upon me or not, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take it. So that's that's going to be my new title here at Campus Reform. Uh, so you you talk you touched on an interesting point about how this is something we've covered at Campus Reform a lot is the uh, kind of viewing all of history through the modern day lens and, and especially through the the lens of like the, the racial lens and the gender lens and well we can only study certain authors if they have if they can check these boxes kind of this intersectionality of you know they have to do, be across the board for us 
And one thing we we noticed and kind of the analogy that I like to use is like in, in sports, for example, I'm a big NFL fan. Yeah. You know, 19 of the top 20 running backs are black men. And you don't say, well, we're only going to talk about certain athletes because of their skin color or, you know, we're only going to talk about the greatness of athletes to a certain level, but it's too racially homogenous. So we're not going to talk about as a whole. I'm looking at it as a sports fan. I'm saying, I don't care what you look like. If you're a great player, I'm going to watch you. I'm going to enjoy it. I might draft you on my fantasy team. I really don't care. I care about your merit, what you're bringing to the table. We're not kicking out certain players because of that. We're saying, hey, who's bringing what to the table? And in history, it's complete opposite right now, where so many colleges are saying our writing that we're studying is too homogenous. And it's not saying, well, let's look at the merit of what was written. It's saying, let's look at the the skin color of the people that were writing those things, which at its core is, is actually... I would say more offensive and more racist. And and where does that come from? When did that start to rise up? Because obviously you, you touched on 2016 being when you saw it first, but what, what are the roots of that? that? You know, that's such a good analogy. And I say a lot on the show that judging the past by the standard of the present makes you stupid, right? It makes you so stupid because the whole point of doing any reading at all is to encounter a different mind. If all you wanted were your own ideas and values, you would never have to open a book ever. You could just sit in your own head and rave in your own prison cell. That would be perfectly fine. But the reason we open books at all is because they contain other visions of the world than ours. And the reason that we open old books is because the past is another country. And there are many things that we may find extremely disturbing that our you know, intellectual forefathers did not. I, a, an example I always use is, you know, we, we did an episode on Plato's Symposium, which is one of the great works of Western philosophy. And um, an, an Athenian philosopher, Plato, writing, looking back on his mentor, Socrates. And, and one of the things, you know, we came to this point where there's a lot of um, homoeroticism and, and gay sex in the Symposium. And I knew that a lot of my audience would find that uncomfortable. I find the age dynamics in the di- in the dialogue really uncomfortable. I, I think they're immoral. But I sort of paused and said, you know, this is a great example. If we just sort of say, okay, this, we, we can't accept this sexual ethic. So we're going to toss this entire dialogue out the window. Think how much we'd lose. I mean, one half of the entire tradition of thinking about love in the West is basically contained. The lodestone of it is contained in this dialogue. You shrug it off because you don't agree with the politics of it or you don't agree with the ethics of it. You've lost everything. And, and you know, the right rarely, rarely does that. The right is, is willing to read the symposium. The, the campus left is just doing that right. You know, that's kind of their, their whole modus operandi. It's everything they do now. And yeah, I, I noticed it start in 2016 in the sense of that's when I thought this has gone really crazy. But when I really sort of stopped and think, thought about it, this goes way, way back. And I've, I've been saying, to be as blunt as possible, it was done on purpose and it was done by commies. This is something that began with you know, Antonio Gramsci and Herbert Marsus and Angela Davis and these, these folks who basically realized that communism and socialism don't win as economic arguments, even though they're all about the economy. They don't win as sort of ways to sell a nation on ruling yourself. So you have to set about to change the minds of the people culturally. It's called a long march through the institutions. And this was done intentionally to kind of feed into not only our universities, which are the kind of big sexy thing to talk about, but our elementary schools and our high schools, right? Howard Zinn's People's History, which has been taught as if it were kind of, you know, just standard history for decades now. It's utterly revisionist, anti-American, radical history and has been basically succeeded and one-upped by the 1619 Project, Nicole hannah Jones' screed in the, in the New York Times, which has now been sort of translated into this curriculum backed by the Pulitzer Center, right? I mean, talk about the institutions. They really took over every major thought production center in the country. And that's how this happened. And that's why it's so important for us to fight back in exactly the same way. And so you touched on the 1619 Project, and it's fascinating to see how the historians that are critiquing it, you got uh, you know McPherson, for example, coming out and saying, this is, I think the quote he used was, um, this is a work of fiction, I believe is what he called it, about the 1619 Project. And Nicole Jones' response was, well, uh, you're, it's, it's angry old white men that are coming after me. And kind of implying that anyone doubting her must have been a racist or anyone doubting the 1619 Project was racist. And do you think more people in academia aren't speaking out 
because they agree with the new kind of revisionist form of history and because they genuinely want to implement it? Or do you think there's a large you know, portion of those people that are just scared into silence because they don't want to be labeled a racist and they just kind of stay quiet? What do you think the breakdown is there of like the pure ideologues versus the people that are just doing a, you know, a risk reward in their head and saying it's not worth me risking getting labeled this? I think the vast majority of people are scared. And I think that there is simply no substitute for courage in a situation like this. I can't tell you how many letters and contacts I get from people in the academy, some of them former colleagues of mine, some of them just folks that are reaching out saying, I agree with you, I'm in sympathy with your project, I hate this new racialist dogma, but I don't feel like I can speak up. Now, I'm very, very lucky because I work at the Claremont Institute where, if anything, my employers will be mad at me if I don't speak up enough, right? That's kind of my whole job is to talk about this stuff. Many of these folks are facing real persecution. And those of us who read our Bibles know that, you know, the truth very rarely has a day in the sun where it is not persecuted. And so this is always the cost of speaking the truth. You always have to be willing to stand up and risk the bad grade in the class and risk the, you know, loss of tenure. All of this stuff, they, they will come for you. But they're such bullies and they're such cowards and they're, they're actual true numbers of true believers are so small that in fact, when you stand up to them, often what you find is that you have an entire army behind you. I think all the time about the prophet who, you know, was, was outnumbered. He saw Jerusalem outnumbered and then God showed him a vision of all the chariots of fire that were arrayed behind him without him even knowing, right? Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. And we always think that we're just the, this lone voice because everybody else is thinking the same thing. I can't, I can't talk. And then the minute you say something, you get this huge army behind you. You know, they'll come for you, but, but we can win this. And, and I think what you say about Nicole Hannah-Jones is a great example. I mean, she also said at one point something like, this is not history. I've never said it's history. It's journalism, by which we, of course, mean it's yeah. activism, right? It's, it's propaganda. And, and that, you know, listen to them when they tell you who they are. The, the right really needs, I think, to wake up about this. And many of us have already, and some of us are on the way. But when they tell you they are coming for you to undermine the very foundations of your country from elementary school all the way up through the universities and beyond, they are not kidding. And so you, we need to stand up. And so when you talk about revising history and it's, there's kind of a breakdown now where it's not just revising history, it's also completely removing it and, and saying, well, we're going to take out the portions we don't like where it used to be. We're going to teach the portions we don't like. It might be biased, but we'll still teach it. Now they're, they're outright removing many portions. So I think the most immediate um, kind of result of this is a lack in pride in America. You look at polling data, young people less patriotic than they've, they've been on record, less likely to say that they're proud of their country. And no wonder when you go to class every day and, and you associate patriotism with being proud of genocide and slavery and oppression. It's like, of course, who would, who would say they're proud of that? So if you're brainwashed into thinking that's your country, you're not going to be proud of it. And you're not going to want to preserve the culture. You're not going to want to uphold the values. You're not going to want to protect the civilization if you think it's something that needs to be fundamentally you know, revamped and reversed. What are some other results of this? B beyond just kind of the lack of patriotism and the lack of pride, what do you see as the short and long-term results of this type of education? Well, this new development or new-ish development of not only critiquing but actually erasing the past is one with a long and dangerous history. We just published in the Claremont Review of Books, which is the quarterly magazine that I work for. We published an essay on millenarian mobs by Angel Angela Cotavilla, which is this, this idea of when, when you think the end of the world is coming, there have been, over the course of the history of the West, these uprisings that want to destroy the world for their own vision of utopia. I personally have been thinking a lot recently about the what we now scholars call damnatio memoriae, which is this modern phrase for the condemnation of memory that occurred throughout Rome's history. When, when people really hated a previous leader, they would scrub him from the records and destroy his statues and, and tear them down. What we learn from studying that practice is that it's not actually, we, we talk, I talk casually about erasure, that it's about getting people off 
of the record. It's not actually quite that. Pliny the Younger made a speech in the Senate in which he talked about how much he enjoyed Demnatio Memoria, how much he enjoyed tearing down the statues of Domitian, the former emperor. And he said, I loved it because I felt as if I would get blood and pain out of the statues. We thought that we were going to hear their screams. And, and that's what they're looking for. They're looking for justice, justice for, for things in the past that happened, many of them truly horrific and atrocious, but of which the culprits and the victims are long dead and in the ground. And so there is no way, much as you may wish, to kind of make people pay for that. There is no way to do that. And so the, the, the major consequence of it is that it becomes a sort of religion. This is why, and there have been people who have written about this for decades now, much older and smarter than me. You know, Rene Girard is one, Joshua Mitchell is another. Uh, these guys have pointed out that the, the scapegoat impulse, the impulse to find somebody and make him pay for everything that's wrong with the world is ubiquitous in human societies, all over the place. You see it happening all the time. Every, the letter to the Hebrews talks about all the sprinklings of animal blood that had to be you know, poured on the congregation to atone for the sins. That's what this is. And again, if you read your Bible, you know that there is only one version of that which is effective. It has already happened approximately 2,000 years ago, and that's that, right? You must move on from that mode, that tribal mode of retribution. And really, the kind of end game of this, even beyond a loss of patriotism and a loss of faith in the country, is a return to primitivism and tribalism of the kind that is sort of demonstrated in that tearing apart of statues. That's where this is going. And so what's the solution? I mean, obviously, you, you, I think awareness is an, an important element of it, just getting people aware. But tangibly, we're going to have people that are watching this that are getting fired up, and, and rightfully so. Where do they take that energy? What do they do? Yeah, uh, I'm really glad you asked, because first of all, this is like every big conservative essay for a while. I was really dissatisfied with the fact that all these big conservative essays would lay out the problem in the most succinct and precise terms. And then the last paragraph is always, you know, solutions must wait for another essay or something along those yeah. lines. Right? You know, we never talk about this. But Washing the hands. I did my part. Yeah, I, exactly. I've told you I'll the problem. You guys take the solution. Yeah, exactly. Um, so here's the thing. Everybody thinks that the front lines of this fight are people like you and me that people, media creators and folks that are fighting these big flashy battles in the universities are the kind of front, front guard warriors uh, leading the charge. In my opinion, you and I are much more like standard bearers. We are we're the people that carry the flags and lead the army. But the true fight is going to be fought by a, like a much larger infantry and foot soldiers of individuals having kids and raising them the way that they want them to be raised. School choice and, and homeschooling are under attack right now by the left, but they are also becoming more and more popular as public schools fall apart in the wake of the pandemic. The public school response to coronavirus has not worked and people are dropping out of public schools. We conservatives must be there to offer an alternative solution. And our alternative solution should be classical education from the ground up. You know, John Milton, the great English sort of revolutionary and advocate of free speech and then author of Paradise Lost, um, was, was famous for advocating in his day that like kids should be taught Latin basically from the womb. Like this is, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but not much. And, and, and the idea that young kids aren't smart enough or ready to receive some of the rudiments of the great Western tradition is a false idea. That's only because we've been dumbed down for so long by these commies. And, and what we will discover as we move away from public schools and start investing in the education of our children is that our kids are not only ready to receive a classical education, they're hungry for it. And that will be the beginning of, of the movement. That's really where all of this has to go. And, and, and people with platforms, I think, should be advocating that and defending it all the time. Yeah, I completely agree. I always tell people also for, for the parents um, and, and the young adults, go, getting involved in, in local school boards and not washing your hands of local politics, but diving right in and involving yourself in the curricula at the different schools where your kids are going. And those are all tangible things. And, you know, they I think that the far left really wants to operate in darkness. They they enjoy when the right just kind of sits back and says, well, the left has academia. We knew that, you know, and that's what they want. They want you just to say, well, it's too far gone. And so that's, I completely agree with you there. Um, it, I want to wrap up with 
kind of your advice to the student on campus right now who I think a lot of people are terrified of talking positively of Western culture because it's been so demonized. You know this. I've been on 100 plus campuses. I've talked to thousands and thousands of college students. And I think a lot of people associate a pride in Western culture with kind of like a, a I hesitate to use this, but I do think that people associate with white nationalism sometimes because they think, well, if you're proud of Western culture, that must be a dog whistle for being proud of other things. And I think obviously there will there be people at times that hijack it for that purpose. But in general, I think just the pure virtue of the West is sometimes lost because people are afraid of being labeled as all these horrible things simply because they are proud of the history of Western culture and all the good it's done. What's your message to the person on campus right now that's terrified of the outrage mob coming for them simply for saying, hey, there are good elements here that we should study and we should learn from and we should embrace? So since I assume those people are listening because they are your yeah. audience, I'm going to speak directly now to those people, uh, those college students who are afraid, they're thinking that they actually do believe in the West or some parts of it and they feel that spark of delight when they encounter the great texts and they, when they read Homer or Cicero or whatever. Uh, but they're afraid, right? If, if that's you, I wish that I could tell you just speak up and everything will be fine, right? I wish I could say we are going to form a culture where there are never any consequences to speaking the truth. It's always something that's welcomed. I can't in good conscience say that to you. I cannot guarantee you that you will not receive some terrible unjust punishment for speaking the truth. My tradition teaches me that terrible and unjust consequences often come for speaking the truth. They may not. You may find that many more people believe what you believe than you think, and that people are much more open and willing and receptive to hear what you have to say than you expect. I hope from the bottom of my heart that that is what occurs. If it is not, if it turns out that you do actually have to stand your ground against some form of persecution, maybe your teacher gives you a bad grade or shouts you down, maybe something even worse happens. If that's the case, I just need you to know that the only success worth having is success won by the truth. Go and read C.S. Lewis's uh, essay, The Inner Ring, which is about this, that when you are invited to succeed by becoming a scoundrel, one day you will turn around and look back and realize it is all worth nothing. It is all lies. If you lie to succeed, you will have empty hands at the end. If you lie and get somewhere you want to go, it won't actually be what you thought it was going to be. If you tell the truth, you may be hounded out of your job, you may become a millionaire, but either way, you will have meaning and you will have true friends. And those are the only things that matter in this life, this side of heaven. Mm, amen. I like that. And uh, I completely agree. And I think you touched on something earlier that, that, that kind of wraps up nicely what you just said. There are always more people that agree with you than you think. Yep. And I just, I would encourage people kind of piggybacking on what you said. I can't tell you how many people are waiting for someone to speak up. It's much easier in that class, in that lecture hall of 50 people, or at that event on campus, or you know whatever it is. It's much easier to follow once someone else just steps up and gets the ball rolling, and you will have people that will come up after, and they're gonna thank you. They're gonna say, thank you for doing that, I was terrified. You're gonna get messages on social media of people that will say, I didn't know anyone else agreed with me in class. Thank you so much for doing that. And even if those people don't agree with you, the people in the middle that are just apathetic that you might think hate you, they're actually getting to hear the other side and it's going to influence them. Who knows? It's kind of planting that seed and you don't know where that's going to go. And, and when those people message you on social media and say, I agree with you, but I'm too scared to speak up, the immediate response must be, thank you so much. Now you have to do it too. Pay it forward. Yeah. Right? You have to, now you have to do what I just did, which is say what you are afraid to say. Challenge them. That's what it's yep. about. And so um, I, I, in closing, I want to give you a chance just to kind of talk um, just wrapping things up on, on why this fight is so important, why you care about it, and, and, uh, and just kind of why people should care about this fight that's going on right now. Well, as somebody that loves to read old books, <laughs> one of the things I find that is that many bits of wisdom, which used to be commonplace, are now lost and sound ridiculous. Um, and one of the things that everybody used to kind of just know that we now have to recover is that 
true virtuous Republican politics begins in the nursery. Plato in the Republic, which is really one of the great sort of wellsprings of Western political philosophy, does not start by talking about the form of government he wants, does not start by talking about the kinds of you know, legislation he wants to pass. He starts by talking about the kinds of songs and stories that children are going to hear in the nursery. And we hear that and we immediately think, oh, indoctrination. You know, oh, no, we just we, we don't want to we don't want to put jingoism in our kid's head before they're too early. All education is like this. All education shapes the soul from very early on. And if you have a population that is not shaped in such a way as to be free, then every founding father is in agreement that you cannot have a republic. If you do not have an educated populace, you cannot have free government and you cannot have laws that are obeyed by the people who are nevertheless free. That whole system depends on teaching your kids from the ground up. The book of Proverbs says, teach a child in the way that he shall go. And when he is old, he shall not depart from it. It's the only thing in the world that can bring us out of all the other political problems that we have right now. All right, Spencer Clavin, we, we really appreciate that. I'm fired up. And where, where can people find your podcast? Where can they find more of your work? Thank you for asking. Uh, Young Heretics is on every podcast platform you can name. So whatever you use to listen to podcasts, please do just go and subscribe. You'll get an episode every week. If you like what you hear, it is supremely helpful for people to leave a five-star review, tell your friends, give that sort of shout out to the show. And, um, and then you can read my writing and the writing of other very smart people at the Claremont Review of Books and the American Mind, where I am an editor. So, so those are all places to go. All right. And I just followed you on Twitter. Is it at Spencer Clavin? Yes, that's right. And you can DM me there or tweet at me with mailbag questions and stuff like that. All right, Spencer, we appreciate it. I'm Kevin Phillips, editor-in-chief, campusreform.org. Spencer Clavin, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. It's been great.